Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm Dan Pfeiffer. On today's pod, Joe Biden makes another big push on climate and student loans. Democrats try to keep voters of color from defecting to Trump. And later, Strict Scrutiny's Leah Lippman stops by to catch us up on all the Trump legal developments, as well as the border war between Texas and the federal government. But first, Donald Trump's first full week as the presumptive Republican nominee has not gone as well as you'd think for the famously disciplined political savant. Uh, And you don't have to take our word for it. A senior Trump advisor told the staff it had been a bad press week for the campaign. This is according to Politico. Uh, Since clinching the nomination, Trump has floated cuts to Social Security and Medicare, teased a national abortion ban, promised to pardon violent insurrectionists who he now salutes at his rallies, said that some immigrants, quote, aren't people and claimed that any Jewish person who votes for Democrats, quote, hates their religion. Uh, He also hasn't yet won over Nikki Haley's voters, as evidenced in this week's primaries by the nearly 20 percent of the vote she got without even being in the race. And Trump's got some cash issues. Uh, We found out this week that his campaign in the RNC raised less than half of what Biden and the DNC did last quarter. And his super PAC has now spent more than $50 million on his legal fees without much to show for it because uh, Trump is currently scrambling to find someone, anyone, who will help him out with the $464 million bond he has to put up for the New York civil fraud case judgment. Uh, He doesn't have the cash. Can't find an underwriter, doesn't want to sell his assets, and is reportedly worried about uh, the political perception of declaring bankruptcy. So where will he get the money? Here's one of his lawyers on Fox. Um, Is is there any effort on the part of your team to secure this money through another country, Saudi Arabia or Russia, as Joy Behar seems to think? Well, there's rules and regulations that are public. I can't speak about strategy that requires certain things, and we have to follow those rules. Like I said, this is manifest injustice. Props to Joy Behar for getting that out there. (laughs) (laughs) Noted investigative reporter, Joy Behar. (laughs) The Woodward Bernstein of her generation. Just just asking questions. It's it's working. They're good questions to ask, I'll be honest with you. they are. I know Leo will break down the uh, legal issues involved here, but from a political standpoint, uh, it certainly doesn't seem ideal to have a president who's uh, desperate for cash wherever he can find it. Uh, do you think Trump is right to be as worried as he seems uh, about this bond? Yeah, I think he should be quite worried for a whole host of reasons. Now, like his attorney who was just on Fox, I also don't know the rules and regulations about taking money from foreign entities. But mm. if you were to do so, that would seem quite bad politically, right? If you are in hoc to Saudi Arabia or a Russian oligarch or something like that, that seems quite bad politically. Being hot in hot to a Wall Street bank or a giant insurance company also seems quite bad, right? Because one of Trump's bullshit appeals to some segment of voters is his idea that because he's this wealthy man, special interests don't own him, right? He tricked, he lied repeatedly in 2016 about how he was going to fund his own campaign. I can't be bought. I can't be bought. I'm not going to owe anyone anything. And uh, once I'm in office, I don't need to repay any donors with favors. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I can't be bought, but I can lease all of my possessions to one entity to keep me out of prison, basically. Uh, <laughs> and then finally, bankruptcy would be a disaster for him politically because his brand is successful business person, right? That I mean, that's bullshit, too. It's he's his brand. His true brand is reality TV host. But this idea that he is a successful business person who understands the economy, all of that has the potential to collapse if he has to file for bankruptcy six months before the election. And yeah. I mean that. So all of this is very bad for him and is clearly um, impacting his conduct on the campaign trail because he is acting like the old school Trump lunatic that he was before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you're. It, it's a very good point you make about uh, sort of his brand and some of his political appeal coming from seeming rich and successful. Mm. That's also where his part of his perception of strength comes from. Yeah. And if he's broke and desperate, he looks pretty weak. Um, the Washington Post ran a story about uh, how Trump doesn't want to declare bankruptcy. And uh, one of the people close to Trump told the Post he'd rather have Letitia James show up with the sheriff at 40 Wall Street, which is where Trump Tower is, uh, and make a huge stink about it than say he's bankrupt. Uh, He thinks about what is going to play politically well for him. Bankruptcy doesn't play well for him, but having her try to take his properties might. 
I don't care if this ends up being politically good or bad from him. I just I, I want to see Letitia James show up with the sheriff to seize Trump Tower. That's just my most resistancey take on this. I'm going to enjoy it. I think we all deserve it. I just want to see it. Whether it's politically good or bad, I don't whatever. Yeah, we can we can I, figure out that later. <laughs> we I mean, we have been podcasting about Donald Trump for going on 7 millennia now, and one of the <laughs> ongoing themes is this idea that one day we would see him frog march to prison. Mhm. We went we went through multiple impeachments, multiple criminal trials, off the lay criminal trials. I will I it would be a nice Little just amuse bouche to see her <laughs> take Trump Tower, take Mar a Lago, take the golf club, right? Take, take the, the plane, club. take the plane, yeah. take whatever. I don't care. Just, just repossess the plane. Yes, I all it would just be just give us that. We deserve that. I know you and and, and Leah are probably going to talk about um, the you know what can save Trump here legally, but it does seem like uh, Truth Social to the rescue here. <laughs> <laughs> that that he might end up making a bunch of money from his fake Twitter website <laughs> because he snowed a bunch of Trump fans into uh, <laughs> into investing. <laughs> that would be annoying. That's that's probably what's going to happen. I mean, I, the most I guess, annoying. But even thing. then, I mean, he has a lot of money from that, but it's not all liquid. That's his problem. But like, he obviously yeah. has less money than he tells everyone, which is why he was originally. Convicted of fraud, mm, right? mm -hmm. but even also if the money is bad, we forgot yes. that part. You know what else is bad politically? Having been held liable for fraud. I mean, one should would be. like to hope. Should, should be. be. Time should will be. tell. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> but, I know. Um, but he also it just does not have the money. Like he would have to sell his properties to do that, which he obviously is unwilling to do. So maybe she'll take them and then sell them. Like that. Leah and I talked about this. Is and you will hear it, but. It'd be very amusing if that happens. I'd say that. Yeah, it sure will. Um, all right. So let's talk about the, in, the entire week. Polling is a lagging indicator. So it's still unclear whether all of this shit will move the numbers at all. If you squint, you squint at the polling, you might be able to see a little movement, maybe a little, uh, but it's early. Um, but one challenge we've always had with Trump is figuring out which of his political problems to focus on. Um, what do you think after after the first full week of Trump as a presumptive Republican nominee? I think that there is a larger story to tell about his chaotic, narcissistic style that he is. That is just, like one of the thing the we see this in all the polling that there is this retrospective nostalgia for Trump's presidency. Right, people have sort of memory hold what it was felt like to have Donald Trump be president to live on the edge of our seats with this sort of insanity. And so just the fact that he's in the news all the time is good. And all the things he's doing are all about helping himself. Right. So that, yeah, so that's, that's, so that's the, one. that's the larger story. Like you need a larger narrative. What are the, of the crazy shit he said this week, what are probably the most politically impactful ones? To me, it is pretty obviously putting cuts to social security on the table and proposing a national abortion ban. Those are two issues that go with the core of it, the Social Security goes at the core of his working class base and his working class appeal, as bullshit as even that is. And abortion is the thing that drives turnout among Democrats and has helped power our victories in 2022 and 2023. And we know from the polling as well that there's so much work to do to convince voters that Donald Trump is as far right on abortion as we have been able to convince them that the rest of the Republican Party is. He gets a pass because he is a New York wannabe playboy cad who cheats on his wife's and you know, we've said this before in focus groups, Sarah Longwell said this once in her focus group podcast, that people proactively will bring up the idea when you ask them if Donald Trump is anti-access uh, to abortion or anti-choice, they will say, of course, he's not personally, he's probably paid for abortions. And so we have work to do there. And he gave Democrats the opportunity to do that. So those are the two things I would hammer. I do think that your first point about telling a larger story is very important because um, almost by definition, if we're trying to persuade voters who haven't made up their minds yet. They are at least open to voting for Trump or have voted for Trump in the past. And I do think, you know, you can, even though we rolled our eyes at it when when they said it, but like Chris Christie or Nikki Haley, and they're like, yeah, at one point, Donald Trump was maybe fighting for you or said that he was going to fight for you or whatever. But he is now running for president solely to save himself and punish everyone else who disagrees with them. Right. He it, like he will say or do literally anything to keep himself out of jail 
and keep himself from going broke. And he doesn't like anyone who's not for him. And anyone who's not for him is a target. Doesn't like Nikki Haley Republicans if they're not for him. Doesn't like Jewish people if they're Democrats. Wants to shoot people who are protesting against him. But pardon people who storm the Capitol. Like, it's all about him. And if you don't like him, you're screwed. And he's going to screw you over. And if you're for him, he still might screw you over because he really only cares about himself. Yeah, he is a weak, insecure loser who is running for president to avoid going to jail, to help his, help himself, reward his rich friends, and punish his enemies. Yeah, and I think you got to just tell a story to people who are like, well, I didn't think the first term was that bad, or I kind of like the economy, or we survived the first term. And I, I, I think the turn is he is now desperate um, to save himself. And he is even more narcissistic than ever before, right? Because that's that you, we're going to have to actually persuade people of this who are still yes. on the fence. And there are yep. a number. So. And narcissistic is a stage direction, not a word we're putting in the ad, just to be clear. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes. Just. laughs> so uh, Trump's loyal subjects in the House of Representatives didn't make life uh, any easier for him this week. On Wednesday, uh, Speaker Mike Johnson and most of the Republican caucus released their 2025 agenda. They want to raise the retirement age for Social Security, privatize Medicare, get rid of Obamacare, cut disability benefits, cut Medicaid, cut children's health insurance, and pass a national abortion ban that could also eliminate access to IVF, all to pay for huge tax cuts to alleged billionaires like Trump, uh, who could really use one right about now. The Biden campaign jumped all over this, as they should, and they said the budget is, quote, Donald Trump's Project 2025 Roadmap. Uh, obviously, this is an aspirational document. How do we make it matter to voters? I mean, it's his. This is the agenda. If Trump wins, it's not even. This is not like what the right does sometimes. Where they take something that may be unpopular with swing voters that some maybe a uh, progressive member of Congress says, and they just attribute it to Joe Biden. Donald Trump included cuts to Social Security and Medicare in his budget every single year he was president. He says he supports a national abortion ban. He tried to gut many of the programs mentioned here while he was president. There is a roadmap here. He has said these things this week. And so I think you just have to attribute it to him. And because this is the reality, because if Donald Trump wins, he's almost certainly bringing in a Republican House and a Republican Senate with him. That's mm -hmm. just how these things tend to go in presidential years, and especially given what the map is this year. It's hard to see a world where Donald Trump is winning Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and Michigan or one of those states and Democrats are winning Ohio and Montana. Like that just is not, that's, that would be, a, that would be highly unlikely. Uh, yeah. I was gonna say the so, most, the most unlikely situation is that somehow Donald Trump becomes president and Democrats win the Senate. That's just yeah. not happening. That's not yeah. happening. If Donald Trump wins, Republicans control the Senate, like just get the house possibility that Democrats could still keep the house, but I think it's a lower possibility. This is Mike Johnson's plan. This is the plan of whichever person succeeds Mitch McConnell. This is Donald Trump's plan. And this is what they will put into place. And we have to tell everyone, right? That is ultimately what you have to do is you have to shout from the rooftops. And, there's, and here's the thing. You don't have to convince them today. You don't have to convince them tomorrow. You have, to, you have six months to convince people. And we're all going to have to do it individually because the press is going to be so fucking annoying about this. They're just going to be like, just throwing Pinocchios left and right. Ooh, like, oh, it's Donald Trump once didn't say this. And oh, it's the Republican Study Committee. Not not the Freedom Caucus or not the caucus. Like, fuck that. This is what is going to happen. And we have to we have to drive it. And we're all going to have to do it ourselves to our friends and family on this podcast through Vote Safe America, all of that. Like, I think this is a huge opportunity to help explain to people that the Trump, the possible, the future Trump presidency is to a lot of people right now, something that feels a little more orderly than what they feel right now in lower prices or a return to 2019 prices at the grocery store. And we, we have to explain that it's so much more. And here is a perfectly laid out way to do that and i do think i'm actually surprised that you know it's been a day since this plan was released and the trump campaign has not responded to try to um put themselves at arm's length from the plan as they have done with some other sort of extreme right-wing things because there's a few people running the campaign who might know something about politics <laughs> um but i do think it's an opportunity for reporters should the trump campaign or donald trump himself ever venture out of his right-wing media bubble and uh take some questions from real reporters to ask him about not only whether he agrees with this plan, but if he says he doesn't agree with some parts of this plan, ask him why most of this plan showed up in his budget every year when he was president of the United States.
Um, so that would be something good to ask. Uh, so while Trump's been um, sulking at Mar-a-Lago all week, begging for cash, uh, <laughs> Joe Biden has been uh, barnstorming the country to sell his economic agenda. In Nevada, he talked about his plan to build more housing and make it more affordable. In Arizona, he announced a grant that will help bring back thousands of microchip manufacturing jobs to the U.S., uh, the president also relieved student debt for another 77,000 borrowers this week. Uh, we're now over 4 million Americans uh, helped uh, have had their debt relieved by uh, Joe Biden. Uh, he also announced a new climate rule to help ensure that two thirds of all new cars in this country will be hybrid or electric vehicles by 2032. Pretty big deal, um, especially the EPA rule on electric vehicles. Trump and Republicans have been running against EVs, saying they're more expensive and will cost uh, American auto workers their jobs. What do you think about the politics of Biden uh, pushing electric vehicles? I would say I was feeling pretty great about it till I tuned into the Wednesday podcast this morning and I heard <laughs> Disu Demisi say that he was worried about it. And I figured if Disu is worried about it, I'm worried about it. Yeah. Or I and should then, be worried know, about it. That, I did that and then I did some did some Googling on the polls. So, yeah. yeah. But here, here's the thing. This is the right, put the politics aside, this is absolutely the right thing to do, 100% have to do it. Necessary, actually, necessary yeah. transformational, like we're fucked with if we just yeah, have, this gas, is, we have gas, to do this. gas yeah. cars for the next century. We're yeah. fucked, so yeah. And I think the, the politic, the good of this outweighs the negative. I think being bold on climate is absolutely essential if he's going to reconstitute the, uh, the coalition of young voters who put him in office the first time. He absolutely has to do this. But there's obviously risk to it. And one thing that Trump is very skilled at is finding a way to make people believe that the, ch the country is changing and that change is bad for them. And if you were someone who was in the auto industry, you've worked in the auto industry for a long time, you have, you have survived massive transition, right? Globalization, changes in technology, the auto companies almost going bankrupt in 2009. And this is one more threat, right? And Trump, this is what all of what MAGA is about, is that a bunch of liberals, people in California, elsewhere, are changing the country, and that change is bad for you. So we're going to have to push back on that. And I think what do, doing Biden, his relationship with an endorsement from the United Auto Workers is a great pushback to that idea. And so I think he can be very aggressive and push forward, but it's an argument he's going to have to win, uh, for sure. Yeah. And I think, like, I, now that I'll, I'll just talk about some of the polling. So Ipsos uh, did a big poll in the fall. I think it was in October. Um, so on one side, you get a majority of Americans are supporting government programs to reduce dependence on fossil fuels. Great, right? 54% approve that. That could be higher too. But they also, they also support uh, government incentives to encourage electric vehicle uh, purchases. 52% approve of that. And that gets uh, support among Democrats, 69% and 72% uh, of independents. And uh, and even uh, like a plurality of Republicans. So like if you're going to help people, if the government's going to help people be able to afford electric vehicles. They like that. But support for the phasing out of new gasoline vehicles is only at 30 percent and support for government restrictions on the sale of new gasoline vehicles is at 21 percent. So that's that's the mandate part, which is really tough. That's why they keep calling it a mandate now. Of course, it's not. It's like a slow, phased-in process to 2032, right? Um, hopefully, we still have a country by then. Uh, but <laughs> so you a can planet? How about we have a planet? A planet? Yeah, a planet yeah. would be good too. A country planet. Which will go first? Um, so, so yeah. But that's just. It's just. It's important to know what the politics are before we go into this. Having said that, it is extremely important to do, and good that Joe Biden has done it because we absolutely need to make this transition if we are to prevent the worst climate catastrophes from happening. But we have work to do on the politics. It's just, it just is, the case. It's almost comforting to know that, given the massive political period of transition and chaos that we live in, that it is still true. What has been true for a hundred years that is the government giving people money to do things. Popular. Popular. The government telling them not to do something, unpopular. <laughs> or, yeah, or taking away something that people have. No, no they don't like that. And, and I feel like we're back in gas stove hell. They're not, <laughs> the know. government is not taking your gas car. No. They're just you keep regulating your gas car, how many you can new gas cars can be made. Drive it till it doesn't drive anymore, just till it breaks down, <laughs> it breaks down in the middle yeah. of the road. You drive as much as you want. But new You can cars, drive you that gas car as fast as that gas car will take you as the oceans are coming after you as the... <laughs> As the icebergs melt. So it's like, 
Um, all right. So most polls show Biden struggling with uh, young voters. Two of their top concerns, along with the war in Gaza, are the climate crisis and student loan relief. Do you think these policies that we talked about this week, both the EV policy and uh, more student debt relief, uh, do you think this can help Biden with young voters? I absolutely do think it can. John, I'm so glad you asked this question because you're not going to believe this. Whoa. But this week, I mean, this week on Polar Coaster, mm-hmm. the subscriber exclusive podcast for Friends of the Pod that I host, that you could subscribe to by going to crooked.com slash friends, I talked to John Della Volpe, a expert in the youth vote and a pollster about this very issue. And what he said was really interesting. How is that for organic and natural? Good? I'm so organic and natural. And I'm excited to hear what he said because I... I'm a big Polar Coaster listener, yes. but I had to listen to yesterday's pod with Tommy Nadisu and prep for today's pod, so I have not it listened is. to it yet. We are just we are either podcasting or listening to our friends' <laughs> Each other. podcast, so we can prepare for the next podcast. We're in a fucking podcast hamster wheel that I cannot get out of. <laughs> so, anywho, one of the points that he made is that one of the huge struggles that Biden has is there's a massive knowledge gap among young voters between what they want Biden to do and what Biden has actually done. They're just there's a just huge. Um, It's just a lack of awareness of what he's done on climate, huge lack of awareness of what he's done on student loans, and that the only way to get those young voters back in the fold is going to be to talk to them from people they trust about what Biden has actually done and what he is planning to do. So I think these are, this is huge. All of these things we've talked about today, the bad stuff about Trump, the good stuff about Biden, are, is ammunition to use to try to go make a case, right? These are data points we can use, and these are really important ones, I think. I'm I'm glad you said that. And I also think that, uh, Young activists and organizers can can really help here. Uh, organizations that do this kind of stuff. Um, uh, as we were preparing for this, I read the story in Politico that was in prep. Uh, I ran in a couple weeks ago, I think in February, about um, young climate activists, and it talks about the Sunrise Movement. And they, you know, a couple months ago, they protested at Biden's headquarters, campaign headquarters, because he hasn't yet declared a climate emergency, uh, and they keep saying he's going to lose if he doesn't. And their spokesperson acknowledged Politico in the piece that, you know, protests like that could make Biden appear weak and help Trump. But that, quote, it's hard to say right now exactly how we'll walk that line. So, first of all, on a climate emergency, a climate emergency would be Biden using sort of, uh, you know, you declare a national emergency if you're president for natural disasters or the pandemic or other things. It would basically, uh, as, as I understand it, free up some money in different agencies to pursue more climate resiliency, to um, sort of stop more oil drilling, to stop more projects, to stop crude oil exports. So you can definitely make a difference. It will certainly not make as much of a difference as any of the steps that Joe Biden has already taken on climate. It would make some difference. But anyway, so they're, they're very upset about that. That's fine. Like, I realize that even though Joe Biden spent his political capital on passing what is objectively the biggest climate bill in history. There are going to be climate activists who wish he'd go further. I realize that even though he has now canceled student debt for uh, over 4 million Americans, there's going to be progressives who wish he'd go further. And like, that's okay. Keep pushing, keep fighting. But like, we only get the chance to do more if Joe Biden wins. And one way to think about it is your vote isn't about grading Joe Biden's presidency. And it's not about punishing or rewarding Joe Biden or Donald Trump. It is about what kind of future you want for yourself. And Joe Biden was not progressives first choice in 2020. He won. Progressives kept pushing. And this guy who's been pretty moderate for his entire life, decades in politics, ended up passing some of the most progressive legislation in history. And if he loses, perhaps you'll have proved a point. But you will also have done deep damages to the causes that you profess to care about. And I think that's like really important because a lot of young people and a lot of just voters in general are not paying as close attention as we are to politics. I say it's a million broken record on this. And they're going to take cues from, as you said, and you talked with John about people that they trust. They're also going to take cues from organizations and activists and volunteers that are out there. And so if you are part of these organizations, it is not contradictory at all to criticize Joe Biden, say he needs to do more, and then get out there and tell people it is vitally important to the cause of climate change to make sure that Joe Biden and not Donald Trump is president. That's my, that's just my thing on that, Dan. 
I like this new segment of the pod where you just become the Grandpa Simpson meme of meme of old I man just, yells at I, clouds. I, I like, wasn't going to, and then I I missed the Politico story. I'm glad that the team put it in prep. Thank you. Uh, and then I was just reading it last night. And I was like, what? Come on, come on. And I also know, look, and I know the Sunrise movie, like I, I follow them on Twitter and they have like very strong feelings about Gaza and I totally get that too. I have strong feelings about Gaza as well. But it's like, there is, what you guys want is a president who's going to be forward leaning on climate and do a lot of work. And that's what you got in Joe Biden. Is it enough? No, it's not enough. But like the way to deal with that is to keep pushing and make sure he's back in office and you can keep pushing him to do more. I don't know. I don't know. Sorry, I, I just went on another another rant. That's great. People love it. <laughs> uh, another goal of Biden's campaign swing when he's out in Nevada and Arizona was to shore up support with Latino voters, who the polls show he's also struggling with, uh, despite winning 60% of Latinos in 2020. Uh, on Wednesday's episode, Tommy Nadisu talked about the interview where Biden said that Trump, quote, despises Latinos. Um, and they also mentioned that his campaign released uh, this ad targeting Latino voters. For our abuelos... Insulin that costs $35 or hundreds. That is the difference between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. For women, the freedom to control our own bodies or doctors going to jail for an abortion. This is the difference between Joe Biden or Donald Trump. Only one choice is right. And the difference between them is your vote. I'm Joe Biden and I approve this message. So I feel like we'll be talking a lot about the Latino vote between now and November. Uh, I know that uh, when Tommy Nadiso talked about this yesterday, uh, they made the important point that you have to make at the beginning of any discussion of the Latino vote, which is that the vote, it, the Latino vote is not at all a monolith. Um, just like white voters, Latino voters, political views depend on where your family's from, where you live, how old you are, all that. So with all that said, what is your take on both Biden's uh, interview and the ad and just sort of the general outreach to Latino voters that sort of launched uh, this week. It's obviously essential, right? And we'll get into what some of the polling says about Biden's struggles here or potential struggles here. But there, you cannot win the presidency without doing well with the Latino vote. Like that is – there is – there's no margin of error. I mean, with it, this is the hard part about talking about this election is – Youth voters. It's true with everything, yeah. Yeah, young voters, black voters, Latino voters, women voters, voters named John. Like any group, <laughs> you can lose no people, right? So it's like, so that that is true here too. I thought, you know, I, I've seen some and I've heard some uh, critique of the ad. Uh, the people maybe mm. thought it was boring, didn't love it. Here's one thing I say, because John, as you know, I also host a very popular YouTube show. I've political heard. experts react where we <laughs> react to campaign ads. Yes. And Are you going to do a second organic plug here? I mean, wait, wait till I get a message box plug into the section <laughs> of the Latino vote. Jesus. <laughs> so, I'm just kidding. But anyway, one of the things we, I'm not subscribed to the Positive American YouTube channel. But anywho, the, the one of the on things, fraternity leave and you're still doing that. It's you great. think he's not texting me to plug the shit. <laughs> so um, you're tweeting crazy things when you have a baby in your hand. He's just trying to plug crooked stuff. But <laughs> All right. Anywho, he one of the things that I think is worth noting on any ad is we all judge them from like a as if we're Roger Ebert, right? Like it's not that interesting, and where the camera angles and all of this, and just we have to remember always that the campaigns test the living shit out of these ads, and so yeah. it obviously works with some group of voters. Otherwise, they don't run it. Um, but I think it it goes to a point that Adisu made, which is especially with the Latino vote, simply talking about issues and what you're actually done and going to do do for the country and the community is incredibly important, right? So it's going to be not as exciting as a Lincoln Project ad about, you know, Donald Trump's father not loving him or January 6th. It's just like this is blocking and tackling. We've seen it in the polls. It's not just true Latino community is people love the idea that of $35 insulin and no one knows that Joe Biden did that. So you got to tell them, even if it seems boring at the time. So I think that's the right approach. You know, I think the I like the ad better than the interview. And I think getting because the interview, I think, doesn't get to those issues in the same way. But outreach is important. Just being out there showing up and it's you're not going to win back voters today with one ad and one interview, but you have to keep doing it. So I hope that I imagine this is going to these ads will be up the whole time. I hope that this sort of public outreach, you know, focus on Latino media uh, continues all the way through the campaign. I also think the despise Latino comment, he despises Latinos, uh, clearly 
Donald Trump has said any number of things that are extraordinarily yeah. racist um, and xenophobic in his time. Um, but I, I do think I would use the opportunity to, if, if I was asked that question, to say, look, I just don't think that he he fights for Latino voters. I don't. I think he doesn't have a record when he was in office of fighting for yeah. Latino voters. And I don't think he's going to do it now for the following reasons, right? Because I just think if you, again, the only people you're trying to persuade here are people who are like open to voting for Donald Trump yeah. or for a third party. And if they are open to it, then just saying, oh, no, no, he despises you is not is not necessarily the most persuasive argument. Yeah, um, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, we have been <laughs> Donald Trump is a racist like that. I don't think that is a question. He says right. racist things. He very clearly holds tremendous racial animus. I mean, he's a bigot. He's a bigot across the board. But if, one thing that we just have to come to terms with as Democrats is we made that case from 2016 to 2020, and he showed dramatic improvement. Where, or with he voters, showed, he with showed voters of color. Again. Yeah, he's right. He, he showed real improvement with voters of color in over that period of time. So it's possible that that's not the best argument with the voters who are who are open to voting for him. And so mm -hmm. I understand why Biden said that, but I think it's going to you're going to win them back by more showing what you've done and what you will do and what Donald Trump would do that is bad for your community. Beyond it's not just immigration, it's cut it is repealing the ACA. In 2012, when Obama did so well with Latino voters, the most important issue with the Latino voters in our polling was not immigration. It was Romney's uh, support for repealing the ACA. So it's going to be that sort of stuff. And it's why he talked about housing when he went to Nevada, which yep. because uh, and it's true in Nevada, and it's true almost everywhere with every demographic group. When you ask them about cost of living and they complain about cost of living, they mention housing more than any other issue because it's the uh, it's what people spend the most of their money on. And so when you ask people just when you don't give people a list of issues, but you just say what's on your mind, housing comes up all the time. Um, so for nerds like us, there has been a, a raging debate among pundits and political operatives about just how much Biden and the Democrats have been struggling with voters of color over the last decade. Uh, this is based not only on polls, but on actual election results, uh, though the results definitely show a smaller shift away from Democrats than the current polls. Uh, and so this debate ranges from some people saying it could just be a polling issue to others saying we could be in the midst of a full blown racial realignment. Um, and it is true if if the polls, <laughs> if the polls right now and the sub in the you know cross tabs <laughs> demographic groups that we're seeing in the polls, if this is correct, then it probably would be uh, one of the largest racial realignments. Um, big if, <laughs> big if. Um, but anyway, what do you think? What do you think of this whole debate? This is going to be one of those times where you have to hold two separate but true thoughts in our head at the same time. One is the polls are all over the map, and the particular all, all over the map with Latino voters. All right, they're showing gigantic swings that would be a um, massive, like you said, historic realignment. We're seeing smaller shifts, but so that's point one. So who knows what the polls are going to say? That's point one. Point two is even if you just take all the polls and you average them together. They're all kind of showing the same thing, which is that Biden is doing less well with voters of color and Latino voters in particular than he did in 2020. And so whether the polls are right, the polls are wrong, which poll is right, which was wrong, is largely irrelevant in my view from the perspective of activists, organizers, campaigns, operatives, because what are we going to do differently, right? What are we going to do with this debate? Are we just going to say, oh, everything's fine. Let's do nothing. Right. We're going to have to go get every single one of those voters, whether the polls are right or wrong. And so that's ultimately what I think the Biden campaign is doing. But there we have seen. And the reason why people are so worried about this is Trump made real gains. Those gains mostly held in 2022. We didn't see a snap back to 2016 numbers with voter with Latino voters, but we didn't see it worse. But Trump wasn't on the ballot. So what's going to happen this time? And if. There is not if if the if the polls are correct, oh, especially the higher end polls like the New York Times Standard poll would show a dramatic shift. There's no math where Democrats can win elections anytime in the future. You can't do as poorly as we do with white non-college voters and not just crush it with voters of color. And if you're and if working class voters of color are starting to perform like working class white or, white voters, that's the ballgame. Like there's you can't win it. You can't win a national election that way in electoral colleges. It's not. I mean, possible. It, it, yes, if we are a party of college educated white, black, brown, Asian voters, 
Um, that is not a party that will ever win a majority anywhere in this country except for like the deepest blue states. Because there's just way, way more non-college educated voters than college educated voters in this country. That is just that's and I'm not saying that's where we're, we don't know that's where we're headed. Like we are still getting a good, good chunk of non-college educated voters, especially non-college educated voters of color in, ter in terms of the results. Most of the actual election results we have, if you just put the polls aside, hmm. show that voters of color who switch from Democrat to Republican over the last several election cycles tend to be people who had always held more moderate or conservative views, but were still voting for Democrats based on either a historic attachment to the party or because they thought that the party was more welcoming to voters with more moderate or conservative views. And so some of this is ideological sorting. So if you had a black Democrat who's conservative or a Latino Democrat who's conservative or even more moderate, maybe they voted for Barack Obama. And then as the Democratic Party, as they think they saw the Democratic Party get a little more progressive or a little more like ideologically polarized, and then certainly the Republican Party become more ideologically polarized, they even they either started voting Republican or what's happening a lot is some of these voters are saying, I'm not, uh, neither party speaks to me. And this is also why you are not seeing as much attrition among older voters of color, both Latinos and black voters, especially like older black voters are still like these men and women, like strongest demographic group for Democrats. And that has been true the last several election cycles. And that really hasn't changed that much. But younger voters of color, especially young in younger black voters, too, do not have the same attachment to the part Democratic Party as the party of civil rights as their parents, grandparents, great grandparents did. And so that's that's part of what we might be seeing as well. And I also think that there is a it's like a more of a populist streak among younger voters of all races and voters of color who are just like very anti-establishment, anti-institution, sort of like angry about um, economic inequality and maybe a lack of attention to economic inequality by politicians of both parties. So there's a lot of different stuff going on here that could be going on. But at least in terms of the election results, you are seeing that some of this is more ideological sorting um, than it is anything else. There's one more piece of this I think is important, which is it is we tend to analyze all voting groups as if they are static mm. from election to election. When a, a significant portion of the shift from 2016 to 2020 is not so much people who voted for Hillary in 2016 voting for Trump in 2020. It is more conservative Latino voters who did not vote in 2016 or maybe even vote in 2012 voting for Trump in 2020. For whatever reason that is, yeah. it, part of its ideological polarization, I mean, there have been some theories around uh, COVID and all kinds, all, whatever the reason is you're bringing new people out as opposed to moving them from Democrat to Republican, although there is some persuasion happening there. And it's just it, like my answer on this is prepare for the worst, hope for the best, right? Which yeah. is let's just let's operate like we're in the middle of a historic racial realignment, invest all the resources and time and energy and intellectual capital we can to stop it from happening. And if it turns out we did all that shit and the polls were just wrong, guess what? Joe Biden still won, right? <laughs> like, yeah, I think I think it's worth knowing. And I'm sure the campaign is trying to figure this out. And it's good for all of us to know, too is the why, like to the extent yeah. that there is drift and defection, why is it happening? And, you know, there's also there's also has been evidence that non-white Democrats have more moderate views than white Democrats, especially on some social and cultural issues, which would surprise a lot of people. And I think as we are all out there doing our persuasion and volunteering, knowing why certain uh, people, certain voters of different demographic groups are either concerned about Joe Biden or concerned about Donald Trump. Again, their concerns are not necessarily going to line up with your concerns about Joe Biden <laughs> and no. Donald Trump, right? They like almost everyone, certainly will not. <laughs> and they almost certainly will not. By, yeah, again, by definition. And so knowing exactly what those concerns are will help you tr how to try to figure out how to persuade them. And I do think that's why it's important. This debate is important. It's not necessarily as important. Like, are the polls going to be right or wrong? Like, it, that doesn't matter as much. But why this is happening, if it indeed is happening, I think is very important in terms of like how we persuade people come this November. Um, OK, when we come back, Leah Littman. John and I are definitely not lawyers, and we didn't take the LSAT like John Lovett, but here to help us in the latest updates at Trump's trials is an actual lawyer and constitutional scholar and perhaps most importantly, co-host of Crooked Strict Scrutiny, Leah Littman. Leah, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. 
I'll tell you, John and I were talking about what we're going to do on this show. We've, obviously, we felt like there was so much legal news. We tried to read the stories. We read them. We tried to understand the stories. We failed. And we said we had to get someone from Strict on this show immediately. So here you are. So if, you, know, you have to help us and our listeners walk through everything that's happening because there's a lot happening. And from what I can tell... None of it seems great. So none of it seems great. And also some of what Judge Cannon is doing is truly inexplicable. So well, there are some <laughs> things even I cannot explain. OK, well, I'm going to I'm going to ask you to try at least. Okay. So let's, that's a good place. Let's start with Miami. So in the classified documents case, which, as you mentioned, is being overseen by a Trump appointed judge named Eileen Cannon. She has issued an order this week, giving the defense and prosecutors two weeks to file submissions that outline proposed jury instructions based on two pre- different scenarios involving the Presidential Records Act. This has people seemingly like yourself confused and alarmed to whatever ability you have. Try to explain what is happening here and why people are so alarmed by it. OK, so I'll try to explain what jury instructions are supposed mm. to be um, okay. and then explain like, what, the, yeah. what these are not. OK, so jury instructions are things judges tell the jury in order to help them understand how the law works so the jury can make their designated decision about what actually happened and whether the defendant is guilty of a crime. So a jury instruction might explain a super complicated crime that contains like 17 elements and tell the jury, you know, if you find these three things, you don't have to find this other thing, you know, and things like that. Or it might explain to the jury, like, who bears the burden of proof on certain defenses or whatnot. Judge Cannon's proposed instructions basically tell the jury if the president does it, it's not illegal. Like it just utterly eviscerates the Presidential Records Act and the charges that Jack Smith actually brought here, because what her jury instructions convey is I mean, again, essentially, like the president can basically declassify things with his mind. So the jury instructions say, look, you need to define and decide whether something is personal or presidential, but essentially a president's categorization about whether something is personal or presidential is authoritative. And a president can categorize something as personal, you know, after he leaves office and basically doing whatever they want. And that's just not how the law works. And so the concern is the jury instructions tell the jury to basically acquit and they do so without a basis in the law. Okay, I have a lot of questions about this. (laughs) One, even if we were to adopt this completely original, made up from whole cloth uh, definition of the presidential or interpretation of the Presidential Records Act. Once the FBI asked for the stuff and Trump refused to give it to him and got people to lie for him, wouldn't that also be a crime no matter what happened here? Like, is it yeah. also vulnerable on that? So there's still the additional obstruction charges, um, and those could come into play. But I think the concern is that if you tell the jury, look, these documents were essentially Trump's to do with what they want, that that could color their assessment of some of the other charges as well, such that even if Judge Cannon didn't essentially direct the jury, you know, fine for the defendant on obstruction, they would be viewing the obstruction charges through the lens of the government had no basis to be asking for these documents anyways, and that that might inform their consideration of the other charges. And so what happens next? The defense and prosecutors file their competing jury instructions and then she picks them out of a hat. Like <laughs> where, where does it like how, how does she make a decision and what happens if she makes the wrong one? Honestly, at this point, her picking a jury instruction out of a hat seems like the best case scenario (laughs) because, you know, what is going to happen is both sides will file proposed instructions and then she will evaluate their arguments and ask, you know, what is the legally correct, you know, best jury instruction that actually channels the jury's decision making process to reflect the law as Congress wrote it. Um, If, right, she was doing that in good faith, I think she would realize that her proposed scenarios and instructions were pretty far afield from the law. Um, but we don't yet know, right, how she's going to respond when Jack Smith presumably is going to tell her those proposed instructions are completely nonsensical. If she picks the ones made up of whole cloth that don't actually affect the, don't actually interpret the law correctly, what recourse does Jack Smith have? Can he appeal this? Unfortunately, it's very limited because these are not final judgments in the case. That is, they don't effectively resolve the case and they're not subject to an immediate or what's called an interlocutory appeal. So, you know, Jack Smith could, if he wanted, seek an extraordinary remedy from the Court of Appeals, a writ of mandamus, you know, 
And it's possible, right, that a court of appeals would say this is so far, you know, across even a legally plausible border that, you know, we're going to intervene. But it's really tough to get a court of appeals to intervene in a kind of interim stage of a case, you know, with an extraordinary remedy like mandamus. And the 11th Circuit is a pretty conservative court of appeals. And I've seen some fears, and this is going to just reveal how how dangerously little information I know, um, that one of the concerns here is that the way she's doing this what could set Judge Cannon up to be in a position because of, and if I get this wrong, we will edit it out of the podcast, but <laughs> Rule 29, uh, which would mean that if she were to dismiss the case, I think, is this right, after the jury is selected, then that is not appealable in federal cases? Yes. Um, so there are all sorts of procedural maneuvers that I feel like are just ticking time bombs in this case. You know, remember, she just made an earlier ruling in which she said she was not actually going to decide whether to dismiss the some of the charges against Donald Trump on the ground that the federal law under which he was being prosecuted was unconstitutionally void for vagueness, essentially potentially deferring a ruling until later in the case. And so there are a bunch of things she could potentially do pull the rug out from under the prosecution, delay it more. And again, given everything she has done in this case to date, there's every reason to be concerned that more trouble is in the works. Is she, I know this is kind of a harsh thing to say, but is she an inexperienced judge a, or is she a partisan judge? Does it seem like she is doing Trump's bidding here? Because there, like, there are liberal judges and conservative judges and maybe, yeah. but this is not, something that's happening on a, this is not on the federal society uh, entry questionnaire, right? This is something that's very specific (laughs) to helping Donald Trump. Uh, So what's your take based on what you've seen? Yeah. So I should say she is a graduate of the fine law school that I also attended and where I now teach. Um, I cannot say, I cannot say go blue in this context. Um, (laughs) uh, But uh, um, so, you know, I think the answer, I I don't know her. I didn't know her. from what I've observed is probably both, right? Like she did not have a ton of experience when she was nominated and then confirmed in the lame duck session to be a judge. She has very limited criminal experience now. Um, It's been reported that two of her law clerks, you know, quit under what circumstances we don't really know over the last year, although she's fully staffed now. So I think some of it probably is inexperience. Um, But I think it is really hard to say all of it is when she has gone so far over the line, you know, or, earlier stages in the case, essentially saying Trump had like a personal interest he could assert in the documents that would prevent the government from actually, you know, conducting an investigation and proceeding forward with the case where she got unanimously reversed by some of the more conservative judges on the 11th Circuit. So I think it's probably both. There was some talk when Judge Cannon was first assigned to this case that maybe it would be Jack Smith's move should be to try to get her off the case. Is is that still an available option to him or is that for the same reasons you cited about the, the circuit court, not really a viable course for him to take? It's not a viable course for him to take, um, you know, and I think asking would just undermine his own credibility before the mm-hmm. 11th Circuit in the event that he tried to make some emergency appeal to them on some other grounds. Because mm-hmm. here, right, her, the fact that she's made some rulings that have been reversed, even really bad ones, is not a sufficient ground to disqualify a judge. It would have to be like an actual conflict of interest. An actual right. conflict of interest or her doing something that was pretty close to illustrating explicit evidence of bias. Mm-hmm. So, you know, judges in other cases have been disqualified when they've made like discriminatory marks that reveal animus toward like mm-hmm. one of the litigants, you know, yeah. or, you know, one of their characteristics. And she hasn't done that. All right. Let's move to New York State and Donald Trump's problem <laughs> securing money. So. <laughs> As we've talked about on this podcast before, the is part of the uh, New York State case against uh, Trump's businesses. He received a four hundred fifty four million dollar fine. He has filed a appeal to try to get that to get a reprieve on having to secure a bond by next week. He has said he said in that that he's uh, tried with multiple companies and it's quote a practical impossibility for him to do that. Attorney General Tisha James. Ask the appeals court not to grant Trump that reprieve. What happens now? What happens if he can't find the money? So if he can't find the money, then I think Tish James could start attaching his properties and using that to potentially satisfy the judgment against him. This is what happens when defendants can't pay. Then you have the state actually seizing their property and selling it in order to 
you know, raise the money that the mm. defendant owes them. Mm. Um, so I think that is a potential next step is Tish James tries to seize control of Trump Tower. <laughs> Does that, I mean, like takes control of it, like repossesses it or just, yeah, so, or so, just so, takes so, some so. of the money from it? Like is she garnishing his wages or is she repossessing his car <laughs> to try to bring this down to non-billionaire levels or non-fake billionaire right. levels? So the way it works is you repo the car um, mm -hmm. and then you sell the car and you use what you gain, right, to satisfy the judgment mm -hmm. and any yep. remaining assets would go to the defendant. But there is a world in which he actually does lose ownership of some of his properties. And then I saw – it's always hard to tell with these moves, like what's real and what's not, but that she did something in Westchester County today, which suggested that maybe she's putting herself in a position because he has a golf club uh, yep. in Westchester County. Is that is that – would that be the next step to begin to move the case or move aspects of the case there so that she could go after those properties? Well, so um, what you do, you essentially – file a notice of attachment on certain mm. property and you would do that in the location of the property. Mm. Um, so it's not like she's like moving the case from like one location yeah. to yeah. another, yeah. but instead asserting, right, I am going to lay a claim to this property in order to satisfy the judgment of the case and doing that in the jurisdiction where the property is actually located. And I think you explained this to John and I uh, just a few weeks ago, but uh, because our brains are uh, Twitter infected porous, uh, you know, porous mesh or something. Can you explain how the bond works again? And I'm particularly curious about this because there was a clip of one of Trump's attorneys today on Fox News dodging questions about whether he could seek funding from Russia, Saudi Arabia, or another foreign entity to secure the bond. Yeah. So, you know, in order to get a bond, you have to put up a certain amount of money. Um, now, as to where he would get that money, he would be potentially putting up. I don't know. I think that is a question that, you know, Michael Cohen, among other people, has suggested that maybe he would try to approach a foreign country and get some money from them in order to put up money in order to secure a bond. Um, but I don't think we know a lot about what exactly is going on behind the scenes. You know, I think the attorney general has said she's not totally convinced that he can't get a bond as is. Um, and so we just kind of need to see how it plays out. And that's essentially like how someone how a. A typical defendant would get a get get bail, right? Would they put up a percentage and then someone else would take responsibility? Like if he fled to Russia, whoever secured the bond would be on the hook for for the rest? Or how would that work? Yes. Um, so you yeah. put up a certain amount of money and then the bond company essentially guarantees um, that they and you are good for it, such that if you do not do your part, the defendant doesn't do their part, then the bond company right, is responsible for the amount of money. Um, and it's a way of basically deferring enforcement of the judgment um, so that if a bond is posted, you know, it basically tells the court, you know, this person could satisfy the judgment. And so like they are allowed to continue to litigate whether they have to pay up or not, um, but they know they're good for the money again either through them or through some combination of them and the bond company. And will we know, let's say he secures a bond, will we know who financed that? Will, will he have to disclose that publicly? Um, I don't know. Um, I, yeah, uh, you know, I, I just don't know. Okay. That's because that just, that seems to, um, if it is a publicly disclosed thing from a political perspective, it seems to hinder his options, right? It makes <laughs> yes. it a little more challenging to, you know, find a Russian oligarch or <laughs> the kingdom of Saudi Arabia to do it. Um, as opposed to, you know, if, uh, it rests a secret, although nothing with Trump's a secret forever. Yeah. Um, uh, right. Again, like even yeah. if, right, it is formally secret for some time being, it is always possible that people would file requests for public information requests, you know, yeah. as to where they got the money. And yeah. so that's why, you know, we don't know whether it could become public, even if there is kind of a normal rule under which it wouldn't wise. All right. Continuing our tour of Trump's legal <laughs> troubles, let's move to uh, Manhattan, where the case for involving the hush money payment uh, back during the 2016 campaign was supposed to start. It seems to be delayed because of an issue around discovery. Um, help explain what happened there. And then to my understanding today, DA Alvin Bragg said that the documents being requested were uh, mostly not germane and that so that there's a sense that maybe the trial can move forward. Just help us understand what's going on there. And are we going to get to see Trump at a defendant table sometime soon? We've been waiting a while now. 
Yeah. So um, the documents were disclosed because prosecutors have an obligation to disclose to the defense, not only, you know, information that inculpates the defendant, but also information that exculpates the defendant, right, is potentially relevant to their innocence. And included in that category of evidence is evidence that undermines the credibility of any witness that the prosecution intends to call against the defendant. So here, obviously, the prosecution is going to call some people who have had some run-ins with the law. Um, and so there is potentially information, you know, within the federal prosecutor's office within the Southern District of New York that is relevant to those individuals' credibility. And so I think there were some concerns that among this vast amount of documents that were turned over, there were going to be things that potentially change the nature of the witnesses or potentially change the nature of the prosecution's case against the um, defendant. And again, based on kind of Credible people who said they have looked at the thousands of pages of materials and, you know, D.A. Alvin Bragg, it doesn't seem like that is the case. That is, it doesn't seem like there is anything that the SDNY turned over that really alters the nature of the charges or the nature of the case or the nature of any of the witnesses against Donald Trump. And therefore, you know, the case might proceed. Now, of course, the defense is going to say we need more time to look at this. Maybe they think or they will say there were some leads in there that like we need to chase down. Um, but it's it's not clear, you know, as to whether the judge will actually force them to go to trial, you know, pretty close to the original date or initially after the third trial, you know, that D.A. Bragg gave um, Trump. So, you know, as to whether we should see it soon, maybe. But, yeah. you know, everything that has unfolded in all of these cases has always Takes felt longer. like Lucy yes. and the football where yeah. you think it's going to happen and then it never does. I know as people who work in content, we're just trying to plan podcasts and <laughs> things like that. And they keep just moving these things around. So it's right, this was supposed to be Trump trial season. And instead, yes, it's, exactly it's right. wait yes. on the Supreme Court and Judge Cannon and SDNY season. Uh, not 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 this, which is a lot less fun uh, yeah. for everyone and the rule of law generally. So, yes. all right. Let's end on a palate cleanser. Uh, just the very light subject of the Fifth Circuit and immigration law. So oh, Texas God. has this law in place. Supreme Court said it could stay in place, said it couldn't stay in place. The Fifth Circuit did something else. Help explain what the hell is going on. Can uh, Texas start deporting people as if they were the federal government? And if you want to just rant about the Fifth Circuit for a while, feel free. This is a safe space. OK, so we are going to do a deeper dive on this topic because it is so horribly messy and the Fifth Circuit and the Supreme Court are truly messing with just the enterprise of law <laughs> as we know it great, in the process. Great, great. But the yeah. the short answer to your question is no, Texas cannot just start <laughs> deporting people, including people, by the way, who have lawful status under federal immigration law, which is what the Texas law purports to authorize them to do, they cannot begin doing that because the injunction against the Texas law went back into effect after a court of appeals Funnily enough, the Fifth Circuit panel dissolved a stay of that injunction that a previous panel of the Fifth Circuit had put into effect. But basically, the Fifth Circuit had previously suggested that Texas could effectively be immigration law as we know it, and that runs afoul and violates every basic principle of constitutional law, flies right in the face of the Supreme Court's previous decision in Arizona. But this is what the Fifth Circuit has kind of been set up to do. You know, Mitch McConnell and Republican senators have blocked, you know, Democrats appointing judges in states with Republican senators by abusing the blue slip, thereby guaranteeing that Republican presidents could fill that and other circuits where there are Republican senators with people who are so unhinged, they think Justice Antonin Scalia is a Democrat. Like they think that guy is basically a <laughs> communist. And so they've started citing the writings of Robert Bork, who was Ronald Reagan's like failed nominee 40 years ago, because they're like, that's the guy who like we want to treat as the authoritative guy on this subject. And so the Fifth Circuit has just completely gone off a loose cannon. And it's not just the immigration case, right? That is the circuit that gave you the injunction that barred the Biden administration and the federal government from even talking to social media companies about content moderation. This is a circuit that gave you the medication abortion ruling that effectively slapped on a bunch of additional restrictions on medication abortion that the FDA deemed medically and scientifically unsound. This is the Court of Appeals that just said Texas gave parents the ability to 
prevent their minor children from accessing contraception, beginning the next wave on attacks on contraception. This is the Court of Appeals that greenlighted SB8, the notorious bounty hunter law that nullified abortion rights and Roe in Texas before the court formally overruled Roe. This court is just where hope and law and dreams go to die. And they are just pushing the Overton window so far off of this galaxy that they are making this Supreme Court look less insane. And I think that is part of the game. And, you know, they came close again to allowing Texas to enforce a federal immigration law that allows a state rather than the federal government to deport and remove people, which is not how any of this has worked for the better part of 200 years. Um, but, you know, this court is just going to keep on pushing the boundaries of this because this Supreme Court is not inclined to really rein them in. I hope that was cathartic because it was at least it was very informative <laughs> for us. But uh, I hope I hope you feel better after having gotten that off your chest. And I encourage everyone. I need like 75 minutes of uncontrolled screaming. Just what the fuck over I mean, and over. And... That, sounds like a, that sounds like a bonus episode to me <laughs> okay, that, would, great, that would do great. quite well. Yes. Okay. yes. <laughs> Leah Littman, thank you so much for being with us. Again, on Pod Save America, as always, great to talk to you. Likewise. Thanks, Aaliyah, for joining us today. Everyone have a great weekend, and uh, we'll talk to you on Tuesday. Bye, everyone.